you so much for setting aside some time to talk with me today. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. To begin, um, you've traveled a lot in your education. Can you tell me a little bit more about that journey? What inspired it? What it was like to learn and, and study in different places? Um, well, when you leave behind the Iron Curtain, as I did, you know, they are looking at various uh, ways how to leave the country. I don't know if you have seen a movie called uh, East and West. It's an extraordinary movie and uh, it has a lot of resonance with my life. And uh, so, you know, frankly, I think there were, for, for, for many of us, there were only two ways to go beyond the Iron Curtain. One was that you win an European Championship or World Championship in, the, in swimming or tennis, and uh, then you can travel. The other one was that in my medical school, uh, the Department of Physiology had a long tradition of uh, letting the investigators go abroad. So that was one of the interesting motivations why I was interested, in, and I had an opportunity to had a had the uh, at a relatively early age to have a, a, a taste of what science is about. And the department that I, that I, entered, that I entered or, or joined as a student had a extraordinary uh, charismatic gentleman who was my mentor, Andrew Grosjean, and uh, he has been around in various places, including uh, New York, Los Angeles, and, uh, and Buenos Aires, Sweden, and so on. So he prepared me for a journey. So I came to the United States first, then I went to Canada, from Canada back to Hungary, from Hungary to Sweden, back to Hungary, then to, back to the United States to San Diego, UC San Diego, and uh, Rutgers University, and I ended up at NYU. So in my life, I built 17 labs, which I strongly recommend to everybody. You know, I have a saying, it's easier to move than clean up the house. <laughs> and. Uh, Every single time you go somewhere else, then you can not only face a new challenge, but you are entitled as well as motivated to do something new. Can you speak a little bit more about how your personal background has shaped uh, your lenses as a researcher, how you approach uh, the things you study, perhaps how you uh, select certain methodologies or, or interpret data? Uh, I think fundamentally I'm a curious person. Uh, I studied early on. Uh, as interested in uh, in radios, <laughs> radio communication. As uh, uh, in elementary school, I, I built my uh, crystal detector radio. I uh, was admired by a huge antenna that was not so far from our village. And uh, I met a gentleman there who showed me that if you have an antenna and you have a bulb, then the bulb can light up because energy is coming from somewhere. And that sort of mesmerized me. Then as a teenager, I, with my parents, I moved to a bigger city uh, where I could join a radio club. I built a receiver, a transmitter, an antenna. I passed the Morse code. And I was uh, really very much impressed when I joined this club. And I realized that people can talk to other people across the globe. And today, you know, it's not a big deal. <laughs> but back then, especially in a country that was pretty isolated, I said, well, I can uh, communicate with people. And uh, then I did, and uh, I became interested in uh, uh, information transmission. Why Morse code is the way it is? Why is it so slow? Why is it so ineff ineffective? Even though at the beginning it looked very effective. And um, so that was the beginning. And then, um, when I had to choose, you know, where my higher education will be, uh, I wanted to become uh, the first person in the world who would shoot a, a signal to the moon, which bounces back, and we can have an Earth, moon, Earth communication. So I had my goals, but it was uh, kind of vetoed by the circumstances that I couldn't go up to a bigger town. That was, there was only one engineering school that was in Budapest, and uh, my parents, uh, told me that you can choose between the two local schools, which was either law school or medical school. So I ended up in medical school. And then, uh, luckily, you know, by the first end of the first year, I, I was ready to quit because it was so boring. I had to learn 
millions and millions of details of ligaments and bones and all those things that I didn't understand why this needed to fill up a human brain. But then in the second year, I met this person I mentioned, the professor of physiology, and I went to his lab and I have seen oscilloscopes and machines there that was a very familiar territory. And I realized I could use my uh, engineering thinking, uh, my curiosity in that area, as well as uh, do something with a, with a substrate that is based on electricity, which is the brain. So from then on, I had a new purpose in life and uh, the rest is just uh, working hard. You also talked about a research paper that you had written a, a long time ago that was rejected, um, but that inspired a recent book that you wrote, uh, The Brain from the Inside Out. So can you talk a little bit about two things? You know, one, what the publication process can be like and, and what it's like when you get a rejection. Um, but also how you persevere, so how you came to take that rejection in and use it as, as inspiration. Well, uh, again, I have to go back to my, 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 my medical school years, is that I got one type of education. I was raised up in the world of uh, Pavlovianism. Um, that was a fantastic and excellent philosopher for the totalitarian regime of what is represented by the Soviet Union. And of course, before that, it was good also for the Tsars. It, it, the idea is that the brain is there to absorb things. The you know, Pavlovian dog or Pavlovian uh, uh, brain is doing nothing except associate. You just have to provide the CS and US and everything is fine. And uh, that kind of thinking never really appealed to me because I couldn't really understand you know, why the brain is, generally, is, 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 is made to absorb information without using it. And if it's using, then we have to figure out how is it using. So uh, early on, my, even including my mentor, we were looking at how sensory information affects the brain, especially how it affects hippocampus and within the hippocampus, the theta oscillations. So I studied early on on theta oscillations that stayed with me for the rest of my life. And then um, uh, they, I read a paper by a gentleman came, named uh, Case Van der Wolf, who became my postdoc mentor later on, who argued just diametrically opposite, that this theta oscillation is nothing to do with sensation, it's all about voluntary movement. So as I mentioned, I came to the United States, from there I went to Canada, to Calgary, and then I ended up in this, crazy professor's laboratory who had a totally different view. And I realized that he's a smart individual. He just had a different take on, on various issues. And so I began to question many of the ideas as, as well as terms early on that, you know, why things are called the way they are called. And of course, I discovered Wittgenstein and, <laughs> and many other people who had similar problems in different areas of, the, of, of, of science. And uh, I realized that many of the things that we take it for granted are not very clear at, at all. I use the term memory, I use the term information, coding, decision making, just like you and anybody else. But with the understanding that these are made up categories, we don't have to take them seriously. These are convenient words because we need to communicate somehow. I, I became the so-called uh, brain explorer. <laughs> it's an award from the, uh, the Cajal Society, the American Association of, Amer uh, the Association of American Anatomists. And with it came the privilege to write a review about anything. <laughs> and <laughs> I thought it was a good opportunity uh, to write about those things that bugged me for a long time. So I did. I would say, in retrospect, it was pretty naively, naive, because I learned that, that if you write a manifesto, then, and you are just uh, unhappy about something, nobody cares. You have to have solutions. This is, this is what's called the, the, the Chekhov's gun rule. Don't put a gun on the stage unless you are going to use it. Because I pointed out systematically, I, I like to believe, that 
many of the terms that are being used by psychologists and NATO and neuroscientists were inherited and were concocted by those people who never ever thought about the brain. So then I submitted a, this review, uh, which got one good review, who was, the review was citing me very positively. The other one basically said, uh, this is dangerous. This is upsetting a lot of people. And the editor of the journal, who was a very close friend of mine, who was an extraordinarily respected individual, she just asked me that, you know, do something else, write another review, which I did. But then those ideas lived in me. And I, with time, I came up with a different solution. And this is what I summarize in the brain is from inside out. So that is, we have to approach the brain with the brain mechanisms as a grounding mechanism. And all those terms that we have have to be grounded or clarified by brain mechanisms. So after I published my, my, my book, I decided that I do a experiment. So I resubmitted the, um, the rejected paper exactly the same way as it was. I didn't even add a single uh, word to it to the same journal. Now it was a different editor, but also a good friend of mine. So he did diligently his homework and sent it to four reviewers. Three of them had no real comments and the fourth of them had comments, but it was basically a pass. <laughs> but what I, I wanted originally is to have the reviews also associated with it. And the original reviews disappeared. <laughs> and that journal didn't want to publish reviews. And that's an interesting thing that you try to publish something and you got, you are facing a wall. And I think in science, the most important thing to figure out is when you're facing a wall, how to turn, you know, if, if your perseverance is too strong, you are stubborn and then you're just hitting the wall. So you have to divert your strategy, not necessarily forgetting the original goal, but just keep in mind that uh -huh, the time is not right to try to attack something. So for me, the most ex exciting experiment is always the, the one that can be solved one way or another. If a topic could be magical, but not addressable, that is a pass for me. So now after 20 some years, the world has changed. And now it's not me in this case, but the rest of the world changed. And then the idea that was rejected back then, it was perceived as almost trivial. And uh, even though not everybody sides with me, of course, and with the, with the inside out approach, but there are many more allies now. I hear you describing this almost a tension that scientists face, where on the one hand, you need to be curious and open-minded, but on the other hand, you have to have um, a, a faith and a, a diligence to pursuing certain ideas when, when maybe others disagree. So can you talk a little bit more about how you sort of reconcile that, that tension? Um, not every crazy idea is useful. <laughs> <laughs> when I was in medical school and I uh, interviewed my first uh, schizophrenic patient, I panicked, literally panicked for a while. I said, this guy is sick. Who am I? <laughs> I have more crazy ideas. But then at one point I realized that, oh, when he was talking about, uh, you know, making a, a, a rocket in his kitchen at home and uh, as a realistic approach, then uh, I realized there is, there is, there's a little difference. And incidentally, if you asked about this, I, this is what I got from my, uh, my, my wife. <laughs> she did. The only difference between a madman and myself is I'm not mad. This is Salvador Dali. So I think the only difference between a creative person and a mad person is that the creative person is not necessarily mad, at least at the time when the person is creative. It doesn't mean that in his or her lifetime, it doesn't turn into some disaster. So you, there are many, many examples. For, for example, in my book, in my new book, the, the brain from inside out, I have many, many footnotes and I traced many of the people's uh, background and their families who, whom I mentioned. And, uh, 
you may agree with me as a psychologist and uh, and uh, i discuss it with, with many many psychiatrist friends not everybody agrees but it seems that m most creative people have interesting genes or interesting backgrounds and uh, the, the prevalence of psychiatric disease in their families is very high there are a couple of interesting studies showing that you know, schizophrenia genes are present in so-called creative people at a much 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 higher prevalence than in others so the interesting thing that if you have a bizarre brain uh, then it's very likely that somebody else in your family will have bizarre brains and somebody else have to pay for your genuity and creativity you know albert einstein had a schizophrenic son um, there, there are many such examples so is that the way to make discoveries uh, that's another question that i don't really have a i'm not an authority to to answer that i just can have my own opinion but when i came to the us uh, my idol the the the, the creative person was my mentor from Hungary. He was the smartest person I ever met in my life. He was the most gentle person, a true gentleman. And I thought this is a scientist. And I met a lot of bastards <laughs> who were <laughs> everywhere who were equally creative. So somehow one axis and the other axis don't necessarily have to be. Plus, as you, you discussed earlier, there's an enormous amount of good luck. But of course, good luck is there if you are searching for something and then uh, you are able to recognize something that, aha, uh -huh, I finally found gold. What other responsibilities do you think researchers have um, to the scientific community, to the general public? What are the, the responsibilities that come along um, with that role? I think we should strive. We should be given the opportunity and we should keep it as our duty to at least go beyond our comfort level and the i think the best thing is to go to talk to college students or even high school students because they are very perceptive uh, there is a wonderful uh, journal called the frontiers for young mind or young kids it you know uh, it's, it's 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 written for for middle schoolers and uh, the reviewers are middle schoolers <laughs> and try to write a paper <laughs> we just wrote with one of my graduate students who actually will dedicate her entire life talking to the public so so this is a new thing i'm sure you have very friends you are one of those who realize that there is such a importance there's such a high value of taking your time and go out and explain it to those people who would like to know because there are so many people who are interested in science but they don't have the access to come to your lab they don't have the ability to ask the right level of questions because you think the right level of questions is your complicated way of, of putting a, lecture, uh, a question but somewhere the translators are needed with this this passion for so many things and, and for life that you seem to express, how do you figure out what to say yes to and what to say no to? Because you can't pursue everything. There's, there's a limited number of hours in the day. Well, time is the most cruel thing that exists. You know, we can gain or take away time from your work, from your family, or from your sleep. So you can choose. <laughs> And, and I'm studying sleep and I know how precious sleep is, but as an individual, as a father and a lab manager, I, uh, I don't want to take away time from my family. I don't want to take away time from my students and postdocs. <laughs> Perhaps you sleep less. Uh, now, what is important and what is not, you just suffer. You don't know. You know how, how would... I think the most beautiful thing in academia, and this is the most precious thing we have, if it's taken away from us, that's the end, that you are working, you know, you are walking on a road and you have a goal. And all of a sudden on the right, there is a palace and you have the right to turn right and pursue a totally different thing. 
So I think that's the nice thing in, in academia that I thought, oh, this is, this is one thing I want to solve. But all of a sudden, you discover something. The most interesting thing that, or the most important word, I think it was uh, Feynman who said in, in the lab is that, oh, it's funny. That it doesn't really fit into my thinking or perhaps nobody's thinking. And then you pursue that. This is called the, you know, discovery science, which is so different. This it requires a different main brain mechanism and brain structure and, and dedication than applied science. But this is where you can see. And that curiosity is, is driving you. And uh, so whether you, you give up, I don't give up the original goal, not because of me, but I'm helped a lot by my friends who are my postdocs and students, and I have to manage their lives as well. So, you know, there are dreams and there are manageable goals. And we always have to have a backup. We have to have a plan B. And if you are working on a manageable goal, let's finish it if you can. Well, thank you so much for spending this time with me today and, and for sharing your insights. Really appreciate the conversation and you know, this emphasis you have on, on curiosity and pursuing ideas and, and passion and collaborating with others and, and just being open to all the new uh, phenomena that we might discover. So, so thank you again very much. Thank you, Arizona. It was a wonderful conversation.